Welcome to our first lecture for Making Modern Science. So in this lecture, we're going to tackle the very broad question of how science works. Especially, we're going to be concerned with how science makes progress in this course, and how different scientific theories build on or reject one another. Okay, so our question is how does science work, and we're going to look at some different theories that have been proposed over the years for how um, science makes progress. Our goal here is to introduce these theories so that we can then take them to the particular context we look at later in the course and evaluate them and see if they match up to what we're seeing in those contexts. Our question one more time is how does science work? We're going to look at a bunch of different theories, starting with a very simple theory of just fact gathering. We're then going to turn to idealism and then look at socially situated science or science that considers uh, socially relevant factors. Uh, a theory that was proposed by the logical positivists known as the hypothetical deductive method, uh, Popper's falsificationism, Kuhn's sociologically situated science, and then a postmodern or a relativistic conception of how science works. Uh, so let's start with the fact gathering view of science. The idea here is just that you gather facts about the natural world and then form theories based on those facts. So suppose that you're an astronomer and you're looking out at the moon with your telescope. You just note down some observations that you make about the moon, maybe about its brightness or its trajectory or if it's waxing or waning, how quickly that's happening, etc. Uh, and then you form theories based on the facts that you've gathered. Your book calls this the Whig history or Whiggish version of science, and the idea here is just you've simplified so much the way that science works into this fact-gathering kind of conception, um, and that's why they call it the Whig history. Another aspect of the Whig history is the idea that there are these great heroes of discovery in science. So not only do you just gather facts about the world, but there are some people that gather a lot of facts and then develop really interesting theories from those facts. And it's just because they are these um, great heroes or great geniuses that they're able to do this. Um, so this is also a part of the Whig retelling of the way that science progresses. This is a very simple conception of how science works. Let's move to some critiques of it. Um, and the critiques are going to come in the form of theories in themselves. So the first alternative we have is idealism. So idealism was first formulated by Immanuel Kant in the late 1700s and then taken up by William Ewell in the early 1800s in his book The History of Inductive Sciences. The way we're going to study these critiques or alternative theories is by looking at the primary text in which they're proposed. So I'm going to pull some quotes from the primary text and we're going to analyze them to best understand the theory itself. Um, this is for two reasons. One, it's a great uh, introduction to the theory, and then two, it's also a great practice in um, interpreting primary texts. Um, so let's start with Kant. Um, so here's a quotation from Kant's Critique of Pure Reason. He says the following, I understand by the transcendental idealism of all appearances the doctrine that they are altogether to be regarded as mere representations and not as things in themselves, and accordingly that space and time are only sensible forms of our intuition, but not determinations given for themselves or conditions of objects as things in themselves. Okay, so this is probably the hardest quote we're going to look at in this class, um, or the hardest primary text that we consider. Uh, so bear with me as I start to um, break apart what's going on in this quote. Okay, so first of all, let's flag that he's introducing a new idea, which is the, tri the transcendental idealism of all appearances. Um, so that's the, the thing he, he is introducing in this quote. Um, now let's flag that there are two things that he's, um, that he's presenting as opposed to one another in this quote. He has appearances and things in themselves. He says appearances and also representations, those will be synonyms, um, and they're opposed to things in themselves. Now a thing in itself is just the object um, which exists independently of everything else. That's the idea. The appearance is what we perceive the object to be. 
Um, so if I look at the moon, the moon exists as a thing in itself, but then there's like me looking at the moon and then whatever mental representation I then have of the moon. That's the appearance or um, how I represent the moon. Okay, so what's the difference between these two? Um, on cons view, there's a really big difference. And the difference is just that a thing in itself doesn't have to be uh, spatially and temporally situated, but an appearance has to be spatial and temporal. This is what he means when he says that space and time are only sensible forms of intuition, but they're not conditions for objects in themselves. Um, so let me put that a different way. The idea is the moon can exist or an object can exist independently, like not spatially or temporally situated, but if I'm going to perceive an object, it's always going to be spatial and temporal. Imagine an object. Does it have extension? Does it ha is it spatially situated? Um, if I consider a chair, I imagine it and it has some spatial length, um, width, height, etc. Can I do that in a way where it's not spatial? Well, maybe, but I'm not imagining an object if that's what I'm doing. So if I imagine, say, an idea, maybe you'd say, well, an idea isn't spatial, and maybe it's temporal in the sense that it lasts in my mind, but it's not spatial. Um, and to which Kant would say, well, that's not an object. Any object that you imagine, he would then say, has to be spatial and temporal because that's the way that we perceive the world as humans. Okay, and then one final clarification. This isn't just a me and you thing. This is supposed to be a thing that is common to all humans. All humans perceive in spatial and temporal terms. Okay, so let's go back to the example of the astronomer we were looking at and see what this means for her. So she is look, has her telescope looking out at the moon. Kant comes along and says, well, anything that you're perceiving in your mind has to be spatial and temporal. Okay, she says, fine, I accept that. And then he says, but that means that whatever the moon is, you're not really understanding it in itself. You're understanding some kind of spatial and temporal representation of it. And so you sort of impose that spatial and temporal representation onto this object, or you're only perceiving what is spatial and temporal. Fine, she says. And then finally he says, well, that means that whatever the moon is in itself, you're not perceiving it. And so if the moon or some other object is non-spatio-temporal, you don't really actually have access to it at all. Um, and so this is supposed to be quite opposed to the fact-gathering view of science. Remember, on that view, you look out into the world, you see the moon, you gather facts about it. Here he's saying, you're not even seeing the object in itself. You don't have access to the object in itself. You only have access to some spatial and temporally situated representation of that object. Uh, so at this point, let's pause and consider in what ways is Kantian idealism responsive to the fact-gathering view of science. I just sketched a way in which it's responsive, um, but let's take a minute and um, think more about this question. So the second theory of how science works that we consider is this socially situated view. Uh, so the person we're going to study is J.D. Bernal, who is a prominent Marxist and, as your book notes, an eminent crystallographer. And he writes this book called What is the Social Function of Science? He writes pretty extensively, actually, on the history of science, and it's noteworthy that this book, The Social Function of Science, was published in 1939, um, and that a lot of his work is right after World War II. Okay, so here's what he says in The Social Function of Science. He writes, We can no longer be blind to the fact that science is both affecting and being affected by the social changes of our time. But in order to make this awareness in any way effective, the interaction of the two needs to be analyzed far more closely than it has been of yet. The idea here is that he's saying um, social changes are impacting the way that science is being conducted or what is being studied. They're impacting science itself. Um, and that then there's this interaction between what science gives us and uh, social changes. 
Um, and then he continues writing, there are two sharply distinct points of view called the idealist and the realist pictures of science. On the idealist picture, science is only concerned with the contemplation and discovery of truth. Its function is to build up a world picture that fits the facts of experience. If it is of practical utility, so much the better, as long as its true purpose is not lost, that is, truth. It's important to note here that the way that Bernal is using idealism isn't necessarily the way that Kant uses idealism. So idealism for Bernal is this sort of like, if you imagine the ideal world in which you contemplate truth. But for Kant, transcendental idealism was a very particular kind of claim, right? It had to do with the temporal and spatial um, attributes of objects of our experience. So um, just, I want to flag that here so you're not confused by this usage of the term. Picture of science really seems to be um, reminiscent of the fact gathering picture of science, right? So the idea is that you're discovering and contemplating truth or what is real in the world. Okay, and then the thing that Bernal contrasts idealism to is realism. In the second, the realistic picture, utility is what predominates. Truth appears as means for useful action and can be tested only by such action. The idea here is just that um, Bernal is critiquing other people who have had this a more traditional picture of science as based in truth. And he's saying that, no, the social impact or the social interests um, are really important to what science gets done. And so truth seems to appear only as a secondary consideration. Utility or practical impact of the science being done is what really matters. Okay. So what does that mean for, say, our astronomer who's looking out at the moon? So we have an astronomer, and the first thing Bernal's going to say is that science is an op scientists don't operate as individuals, but in these kind of communities of scientists. And then the interests of each individual scientist is shaped by society, and what they study is correspondingly shaped by their interests. So some scientists might be interested in the moon today, some might be interested in it two weeks from now, some might in fact be interested in the stars instead. Okay. So we consider again this question, in what ways is Bernal's socially situated philosophy of science responsive to Kantian idealism or even to the um, initial theory we considered of a simple fact-gathering view of science? Okay, so the next theory we're going to look at is called the hypothetical deductive method. So I'm going to walk you through how it works first, and then we're going to look at a short quotation. So here is a quick primer on the hypothetical deductive method or hypothetical deductive reasoning. So the first step is that you gather up some observations. Then once you have your observations, you formulate a hypothesis that you think would account for the observations that you've gathered. Once you have that, you deduce some new observational consequences from that hypothesis or predictions from that hypothesis. And then finally, you see if the predictions are true. If they are true, you're going to go back to step three to do some more observational consequences and check if they're true. In some sense, if this is the case, you have confirmed your hypothesis. If the predictions are false, however, you're going to go back to step two and reformulate your hypothesis, formulate some alternative hypothesis that will better be able to account for the um, observations or give you new predictions to test. Okay, so the basic idea here is just that it's a cyclical kind of process. You're always gathering up observations, formulating new hypotheses, deducing more observational consequences, gathering more observations, etc. Okay, so one thing that the logical positivists really wanted to emphasize is that we have direct empirical access to um, the objects that we're studying. So here's a quotation by Carl Hempel, one of the logical positivists, um, it, from his studies in the logic of confirmation, where he writes, quote, the evidence offered or adduced in support of a scientific hypothesis consists in data accessible to what is loosely called direct observation, and such are expressible in the form of observation reports.
Um, so these, this direct observation, observation reports language suggests that we have this really clear um, way of observing nature. So you might wonder, is it really just like this again? So we have an astronomer and she's looking at the moon. Is it really just as simple as a fact gathering view of science? And in some ways, yes, but it's a little more um, primitive in other ways. So here's what she's going to say. She's going to say, if there were a moon there, I would see some quality or some observation in my telescope um, at point instant xyz comma t. The xyz is some spatial location and the t is at some time. So the idea here is I, if the moon were there, I would see some quality at some time at which I point my telescope to the moon, then I would be able to directly see some quality q. Okay, so the hypothetical deductive method then says, if you do see that quality, you have confirmed the hypothesis that there is a moon there. So if she says, I do see quality Q at point instant X, Y, Z, comma T, then she has in fact confirmed the hypothesis that there does exist a moon out there. Okay. So that's hypothetical deductive method in a nutshell. It might be reminiscent of a very naive picture of scientific of the scientific method or of scientific reasoning that you may have learned, say, in middle school, um, where you have some hypothesis, you test it, you confirm it, or you disconfirm it, and then you might need to formulate a new hypothesis accordingly. Um, so we can consider the question, in what ways is Hempel's hypothetical deductive method responsive to a view of science as being socially situated? In what ways is it rejecting some of what the people who are saying science is socially situated are pushing? Um, and then you might also consider how is it responsive to the fact-gathering view of science or idealism, um, Kantian idealism, etc. The next theory we're going to consider is known as falsificationism. Falsificationism and falsification was put forward by Karl Popper, who was really concerned with this question, how do we get general claims from particular instances? So suppose I tell you, every time I drop a ball or an object, it falls to the ground. Um, so I dropped this ball, it fell, I dropped this other one, it fell, etc. And so I want to make the general claim that any object I drop will fall to the ground. I want to make a general claim, say, about gravity. So Karl Popper um, is interested in this because it's a case of induction. So we take some particular instances and then we want to make a more general claim. That's what we, know, that's what we call induction. So let's look at what Karl Popper says about induction. He says the following. Now in my view, there's no such thing as induction. Inferences to theories from singular statements, which are, quote, verified by experience, whatever that may mean, is logically inadmissible. Theories are therefore never empirically verified. Okay, so quick pause. This is really strong. It's a really strong claim against people like the logical positivists. Remember, they said that um, if you say that you're um, if you propose a theory like, if the moon is there, I'm going to see some observational consequences at some particular time, and then you see those observational consequences, you have confirmed your theory. Popper saying here that um, these kinds of general statements from singular statements in which you get this verification by experience is logically inadmissible, and that theories are never empirically verifiable. Okay, so if theories are never empirically verifiable, you might be wondering, what is the function of science in this case? Okay, so here's what he says. He says, but I shall certainly admit a system as empirical or scientific only if it is capable of being tested by experience. These considerations suggest not the verifiability, but rather the falsifiability of a system is to be taken as the criteria of demarcation. So what makes something scientific is not that it's verifiable, it's not that I can check whether or not, um, whether it is the case, rather it's falsifiable, and so I can check whether it doesn't hold. Okay, he continues, in other words, I shall not require of a scientific system that it shall be capable of being singled out once and for all in a positive sense, but I shall require that its logical form shall be such that it can be singled out by means of empirical tests in a negative sense. It must be possible for an empirical system to be refuted by experience.
Okay, so consider our astronomer. Um, before she was saying, if there was a moon, I would see such and such. She was seeing such and such, and so she was confirming that there is a moon. On Popper's view, what happens when she sees such and such is that she has not falsified the hypothesis that there is a moon. She hasn't verified that there is a moon, so the hypothesis remains viable. Okay, so again, we consider this question, and hopefully it's pretty clear um, what the response might be. In what ways is Popper's falsificationism responsive to the hypothetical deductive method? And then also consider how it's responsive to the previous theories we've considered so far. Okay, the next theory we're going to consider is one uh, put forward by Thomas Kuhn, in which he proposes the importance of sociological factors in scientific progress in communities. Now, this is also a sociological theory, but in a and in ways it's kind of similar to the socially situated theory we discussed earlier. Um, but it doesn't come from a Marxist perspective necessarily; it more comes from a historical perspective. Um, and we'll see the way in which it's different in just a minute. So it's less concerned with the way that society impacts what science has done, but rather with the sociological factors within the scientific community that structure the way that science gets done. Here is an image of how Kuhn proposes that science works. Uh, so the idea here is that there are different periods in the lifetime of, say, a theory or a scientific progress. The most significant period, and that which Kuhn is most famous for, is known as a paradigm change. So a paradigm is a worldview. Um, it might be particular to a subfield of science, but it's a way of seeing the world. So it usually has to do with some particular theory, and that particular theory guides the way in which people in that subfield, or in general, see the world. So a paradigm might be something like Newtonian mechanics, it might be something like um, genetics, it might be something like uh, the Copernican um, uh, heliocentric model, things like that are paradigms. So there might be a period in which the paradigm you're operating in changes. So there's a period in which we shift from a Ptolemaic worldview um, in which the Earth is the center of the universe to a Copernican one in which the Sun is. We're going to study more about this in the next chapter, but bear with me for um, this kind of, for the very general overview I'm giving now. Okay, so the paradigm changes. After a paradigm change, there's this time period known as the period of normal science. Um, the idea here is like scientists are working along and they're doing their normal everyday scientific endeavors. They're collecting data, they're performing experiments, all within a certain paradigm. Um, then there's periods in which the model, the paradigm, it starts to drift a little bit. And then it really comes to a head when there's a kind of crisis, when there's data that doesn't fit in the model anymore, but there's nothing else available. Um, and that sparks a revolution and then in turn another paradigm shift. Okay, so if you look at some any particular subfield of science, you might see different periods of conceptual change, of paradigm shifting, and then of somewhat stability. And the idea that Kuhn proposes is this general cycle of how this kind of thing works. So let me give you some quotes from Kuhn that are going to il illustrate what it means to really live in a paradigm and then how it mean how people make sense of paradigm changes. He writes, quote, In the sciences, if perceptual switches accompany paradigm changes, we may not expect scientists to attest to these changes directly. Looking at the moon, the convert to Copernicanism, to a heliocentric model, does not say, I used to see a planet, but now I see a satellite. That locution, or that expression, if they were to say it, would imply a sense in which the Ptolemaic, or the geocentric, system had once been correct. So the scientists can't actually say that, because once they're in the Copernican system, the Ptolemaic can't have been correct. It doesn't make sense to say that anymore. 
Sun said, what do they say? Here's, here's what Kun says. Instead, a convert to the new astronomy says, I once took the moon to be a planet, but I was mistaken. That sort of statement does recur in the aftermath of scientific revolutions. Okay, so once more, let's look back at our um, illustration and see how it might work. So in a Kuhnian picture, what happens is that the scientists look out uh, at the moon and they suppose that they see a planet. They are a scientific community who sees a planet. Then there's another scientist who starts to develop an alternative theory um, on which this isn't a planet, but it's actually a satellite. It's a moon. And so this scientist at first is going to be ridiculed. <laughs> they're not going to really be accepted in the scientific community because they're proposing such a strange alternative theory. But as the evidence starts to stack up against the former scientists, people start switching sides. They start to um, believe this new scientist and the, there eventually will be a switch in paradigms in which the uh, former planet is now going to be considered a moon or a satellite. Okay, so that's the Kuhnian picture of how science works. So we consider again the question, in what ways is Kuhn's sociological emphasis responsive to falsificationism and responsive to the hypothetical deductive method in particular? The last theory that we're going to consider is a postmodern view of how science works or a relativistic conception of scientific truth. The postmodernism builds on a uh, thinkers like Jacques Derrida and Michel Foucault, but I'm going to read you François Lyotard's quotes on how science works. Here's what he writes. He writes, quote, to the extent that science does not restrict itself to stating useful regularities and instead seeks the truth, it, science, is obliged to legitimate the rules of its own game. The idea here is um, if you were just seeking out regularities, stating useful regularities, you would be in the realm of this kind of fact-gathering view of science. But as soon as you start to seek out truth, you are obliged to tell me why it is that you get to tell me what truth is. So if we're a in a conversation, you're a scientist, I'm not, you have to tell me what it is about science that will give me truth as opposed to other disciplines or other methodologies I might adopt towards getting truth. So he says, it then produces a discourse of legitimation with respect to its own status, science's own status, a discord called philosophy. So the way in which you will tell me um, why you get to tell me what truth is, is going to be through this discourse of legitimation known as philosophy. Uh, he continues, simplifying to the extreme, I define postmodern or postmodernism as incredulity towards meta narratives. Meta narratives, in this case, are those narratives that tell me why it is that science gets to say what truth is. Um, anything that's like one step up from the narrative of truth. This incredulity is undoubtedly a product of progress in the sciences, but that progress in turn presupposes it. Okay, so once more, the idea here is that Lyotard wants to reject science's, um, science being the unique way of getting truth about the world and any discourse that tries to legitimate science as the unique way of getting truth. Turning back to our astronomer now, it's not only an astronomer looking at the moon, now it's all sorts of other people or other disciplines who can contribute because science no longer has the um, unique way of picking out the truth of the world. Instead, a lot of other disciplines are allowed to do that as well. Um, there's no unique discipline that can legitimate its authority over others. And so each um, individual person looking out and trying to study the moon gets to do so and no particular way of doing so is um, better or worse than others. Uh, so that's the version of postmodernism that Dietard has presented. So in what ways, we might ask, is this postmodernism responsive to Kuhn's sociological emphasis and then to previous theories that we have studied as well? Okay, so here are the different theories that we've studied so far, and the idea is that we're going to carry these theories forward into the particular context that we study, 
in this course and see which, if any, seem to hold up to the progress of those views.